Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, our Smart Cities and the Fourth Industrial Revolution webinar organized by Low Carbon City. I'm very happy to be your host today and to be able to moderate this panel. Thank you for Low Carbon City for organizing this. We have a great we have great participation of amazing panelists today. Um, let me introduce I, uh, one second that I lost my connection here. Um, let me in, let me actually let me have each person introduce themselves. Let me introduce myself first. My name is Catalina Escobar. I am the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Makaya. Makaya is a nonprofit organization that strengthens capacity for social development through technology. Um, we work in Colombia, throughout Colombia, and in other countries in Latin America. And basically, we work directly with communities and with people be building their digital skills, digital capacities. And our goal is to reach digital empowerment and digital equity. And we also work with other nonprofits and other organizations, also building their digital skills and helping them through with their digital transformation processes. So let me... Um, I'm going to ask each of the participants to introduce themselves. Marcelo, please let us know if you already have a stable connection and you can, and, and we can start with you, please. Hi, can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. All right. My name is Marcelo Valanci. Uh, I was born in Argentina and I've been living in Costa Rica for the last 21 years, uh, building, developing, ecological projects. Uh, I started my, one of my latest projects was an eco village. Uh, it's a self-sustainable village where we produce most of the food, the energy, uh, all the roads are made out of recycled plastic, all the, uh, all the sewer from every single house go into a massive biodigester that produce methane and with the methane you can produce electricity, um, you can produce, you have cooking gas, etc. And with that, it started growing uh, and we expanded with a, a school, an alternative education project. And from there, I'm building more eco-villages to create a, a city, a smart city. So that's, that's what I've been working on. Oh. Okay, thank you so much, Marcelo. Jean, can you introduce yourself? So, my name is Jean Danielou. Um, I'm French uh, from Paris. Um, I'm working uh, in the smart city domain uh, since uh, 2012. I started at the French Ministry of uh, Sustainable Development and I launched the first uh, actors research uh, seminar there. Uh, to gather people that are practitioners from the, of the smart city, people who are thinking about the smart city in France. And the idea was to uh, have a cross uh, cross process and uh, feed the reflection about this. After that, I joined uh, the group uh, NG, and uh, there I'm currently an uh, uh, urban policies analyst, and uh, I'm also a PhD student at the Min Paris Tech uh, on the question of uh, the role of private players in the building of cities and the future projection of it. Great, thank you. Karen, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you for the invitation. My name is Karen Rossell. I am a research assistant at the University of Edinburgh. I work with the Center for Contemporary Latin American Studies. Um, I studied chemistry before, then I did a master's in carbon management, which is pretty much just climate change. And I've worked with a lot of NGOs related to climate change issues. And now I am developing a project with Soledad Garcia Ferrari and Kathy Case Hage uh, regarding developing collaborative smart city solutions to manage adaptation and monitoring climate change related risks in Mexico through the Newton Fund grant. And that's pretty much what we are working on. And well, thank you for the invitation again. Okay, thank hey. you, Karen. Um, Hebran, Gibran, I don't know how to pronounce yes. your name. Can yes. you introduce yourself? 
Yes, uh, my name is Gibran Vita. I'm from originally from Mexico, but I have been living in Scandinavia and, and in Europe for the last eight years. Uh, I've been working in the field of industrial ecology, which is the field that provides all the tools to um, study the socio-economic metabolism of cities. And I've been focusing on linking the production with the consumption and the material flows and stocks. And my PhD research was focused on connecting all these uh, flows of material and energy to the well-being of people, to the fundamental human needs. My uh, in the late in the last years, I've been working for uh, projects in the European Commission about green lifestyles and upscaling regional sustainability and uh, solutions that have a holistic approach for sustainable lifestyles, including city design, but also psychological aspects and to balance a little bit more the technological or technocentric uh, approach that we had so far. And I'm currently working at the Castle of the Sustainable Resource Group at University of Castle uh, with indicators for circularity and sustainable resource use, etc. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody, for the introductions. I think that each of you comes from a different background, which makes this panel even more interesting. So I have uh, several questions to ask you. And uh, of course, I, I would like each of you to respond based on your perspective and your experience. And the first question is, what are smart cities for you and why are they important? So I'm not looking like for a, like a one size fit all definition because I think it's very difficult, but I would like to, for each of you to let the public know what is a smart city for you and why is it important? Karen, let's, let's start with you. Okay, well, for, for our studies, the ones that we are developing right now, what we're considering a smart city is a region, it can be a city as itself or just a municipality uh, that uses technology to increase its efficiency. Um, it looks for the optimization of the city functions, and it also has to consider um, as a name the, to increase the economic growth of the area, to improve the life quality of the people living there. And it can use data analysis to make a more, um, a more efficient use of the technologies. Um, that's what we understand as smart cities in the research that we're currently doing. And we do think that they are really important because trends show that in the future, in the near future, 60% uh, of the population by 2050 will be living in cities. And we know that cities affect everyone, even if, even the ones that are not currently living in cities. Looking from a climate change per perspective, um, most of the greenhouse gas emissions are created in cities. Pollution, the most pollution is created in cities. So even if people are living in rural areas, they will be eventually be affected mm -hmm. by, by everything that is happening in cities. Um, we understand also that like in, for the public perspective, um, there has been an increased investment in smart cities technologies in the past years. So uh, that's actually arising a trend that it's start to keep going like from city to city everywhere in the world it's going to happen we like it or not so we should actually try to do our best to create the best type of smart cities that actually help society in their day-to-day -day lives yeah thank you Can you just a quick follow-up question um when you say analysis you mean like also like data like using data to an, to do data analysis and things like that? Yeah, yeah, of okay, course. Perfect. Like, well, yeah, would you like me to elaborate or, yeah. Let's let's continue and probably okay. we'll dig Good. deeper into this whole thing around data because I think is finally is the backbone of the fourth industrial revolution. So I was just interested uh, yeah. in that. Um, Hibran, um, can you give us your perspective about what is a smart city for you, like from where you come from? Yes. Um, well, I, can I share my screen? Is it possible for a little bit? I think you can. 
I don't know if I if I need to give you any permissions, but I um uh, can, okay, I'm, let's I'm try. trying to Okay, yes, great. Uh, I'm just I just wanna use some visuals. Can you see this? I can see them. I hope that everybody else can see them. Okay. So, well, for me, in, I have been uh, working on the smart city in different different fronts, in the more technological fronts, and recently in the more low tech fronts. And what I understood is a uh, smart city is like one concept, but it has many visions depending on who is using the the word. Like Marcelo working with eco villages looks more like the the green landscapes here. And John probably looking more in, in those high tech kind of visions. Uh, one thing that I came to realize is that the common discourse is that we need more data, more automation, more technology, and more efficiency, and more top down planning, which is all fine. Uh, but I, I think the risk of this focus is that it becomes the focus in itself of the smart city, and we lose that the perspective. Uh, that, or the science-based evidence about what makes a city really, really resilient and really uh, meet climate goals, which is not the data in itself, but the prevalence of grassroots initiatives, the focus on well-being and human needs, the focus on the time that people have available to engage in these goals, the presence of undetermined spaces, which is a concept by Saskia Sassen about having spaces that are neither for consumption, neither for production, just spaces for people to make their own. And uh, the city is designed for green choices, which means not leaving everything up to the people, but try to edit out those choices that are bad for the environment, bad for democracy and so on. Uh, and of course, much more bottom up visions. And one of the common issues that we have in, in city design is that there is normally uh, very often not a vision it's just um uh i'm gonna stop sharing for that uh one of the problems that i find is is the, the there is often not a not a not a vision that comes from the citizens and in one of the projects we went around several european countries to try to discuss with its stakeholders uh, their visions of the of the smart cities or of the future and we find out that they have a lot to do with uh, social practices and not so much with technology as we thought. Of course, people foresee renewable uh, electricity and some Internet of Things and, and stuff like that. But really, a lot of the people focus on how they're going to live, how they're going to have, uh, what are they going to do in their free time and the relationships they're going to have to each other and how they're going to eat and all these things that it was surprising for us. And in the next, in the next week, we will we'll publish a paper in Ecological Economics journal where, where we analyze these 30, 31 visions of the future cities uh, by stakeholders, not by top-down planners, but by actually citizens and front runners in grassroots initiatives. So I'll keep you posted on this. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, Marcelo, can you give us your perspective? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, for me, a smart city, um, it's a city that integrates many, many aspects, not only uh, technology, but taking where all the resource or all the resources that we consume, where do they come from and where do they go? How do we treat them and how to be smart about every single decision from the conceptual design? All the way to the end so pretty much it's like most of the cities today they are carbon dependent cities if you don't have transportation trucks or something that bring you the food from outside the way that we move around the cities the way we consume electricity or something most of the buildings are not the, like if you have no electricity they do not function so we are so dependent into this one source that we are run like most likely would run out in a few years i don't know if it how long that will take but we have to be smart about creating smarter cities and and not only design for humans but for all creatures around and thinking about trees thinking about not only not only for us but for 
all the animals for shape, for water, and making it a much uh, longer um, design, not a design just for our generation, but for many generations to come. So that, that I think it's a smart city and taking those uh, factors into account when you make the design is very important. Uh, how you're gonna move around, what are gonna be the, the resources, where the water is coming from, how do you treat that water, how can you reuse it, and so on. I think that's part of a very smart city. And just a follow-up question, and this might sound obvious, but Marcelo, I assume that that's the vision that you have implemented and refined over the years and iterated over the years in the Eco Villas. Uh, yeah, that's correct. And it keeps being refined and more elements come and more, uh, more incro it's creating the container for innovation, for new ideas to, to happen, to test and see what works best and, and keep learning and growing. Great, perfect. Thank you. John? Yes. Um, what I learned uh, to when I launched the seminar in the Ministry of uh, Sustainable Development was that uh, the concept, the very concept of Smart City was created in 2008 by the IT company IBM, and they created a vast mm -hmm. program named uh, Smarter Planet. And inside Smarter Planet, there was like uh, a topic named Smarter Cities. And the whole idea of IBM was to say, okay, uh, let's face the, f the fact that we are developing technologies that will change the way we optimize uh, our systems and general systems all over the world. And if we understand cities as uh, vast complex systems, they are the most addressable for uh, the question of uh, uh, optimization of systems. And the whole idea of IBM was to develop a new market of systemic optimization of complex systems. Uh, taken from this point of view, uh, the Smart City is a brand uh, created by one company, IBM, and which created like, uh, I think, uh, like a vast, uh, I don't know, it, it break, broke the ground of many companies because it said to all the urban fabric, uh, a newcomer uh, is uh, coming in the game, it's the IT companies, and they are able to produce the city also because they will optimize all the systems you are currently uh, uh, managing. And so for uh, traditional players, like energy players, like uh, people who are building the cities, uh, people who are maintaining their uh, waste and water infrastructure and so on, it was a big message saying, if you don't take the digitalization pass, uh, someone else will come and uh, make it at your, play, um, at your place and will replace you at the end. And so it led every big company, private companies, to in this direction. We have to uh, be, uh, we have to take the, digit, the digitalization turn if we don't want to be a uh, loser of this uh, new era of cities as vast system, uh, vast complex system that can be optimized. That was the first wave of smart city uh, from mm -hmm. 2008 to uh, mid 2015, something like that. Uh, in fact, uh, there was also from the public side a big reaction saying, okay, we have a new uh, concept. Uh, what do we do with that? Uh, how do we manage this concept? How do we appropriate this concept? And it was from a very different point of view because the question for public players was how do we put the citizen at the heart of our concerns because we want to be elected again. So we want citizens to participate to this production of this smart city. It shouldn't be uh, only uh, uh, like uh, um, about pipes and uh, optimization. And so a new version of smart city came uh, into being uh, from the public side, saying what is a smart citizen? How do we introduce these players in the production of the city and so on? So it was like a translation of the concept from the public side. And the uh, two sides said, okay, how do we do the smart city? How do we optimize the pipes? And how do we integrate citizens uh, in the production of these cities? And so what we saw is that there was a lot of um, proof of concept things uh, like uh, new projects, which are only demonstrators, but no real projects that happened. And uh, what we saw is cities and public players who are pushing this approach with citizens 
saying there is no proper market for that. We will try it first and see if there is a market after that. And so it led to all this um, all these technologies of uh, of manage of experimenting a new form, a new way of making the city uh, from the public side. And the private side said, okay, it will be a market, but when? And it became a real good question for all the private players because they wanted to address this market, but it appeared that this market is not really existing today because there is no smart city uh, in the world. Uh, you can, it's impossible to quote one, uh, the smart city that uh, IBM envisioned, it doesn't exist yet. So we have like this, it's a new concept. Everybody is trying to translate it and say, okay, uh, private players want to make it a big market for optimization of services. And public players are saying, it's maybe the opportunity for us to integrate more citizens in the process of city making. But apparently, there is no such thing as a smart city today. So for me, it's like uh, uh, it's like a concept that is used by many players to justify projects launch and to try to achieve goals, which are both economic and uh, political goals. But today, it doesn't exist as a concrete form inside the cities. So this is how I see things from a historical perspective. Thank you, Jan. Um, so the next question that I have for you is, what is the relation to approaching climate change from the perspective of resilience, adaptation, and also decarbonization? Of course, within the smart cities uh, perspective. I'm going to start the other way around, Jan. So I, I would like you to answer this question, especially because I think you provided a very interesting approach saying that, well, how the concept of Mars cities originated from IBM as an optimization process, the role of a uh, public sector, the role of private sector. And I'm also interested in knowing in, in this or the next um, question, what is also the role of social sector? So Jan, let's start with you. And what is the relation of smart cities to approaching climate change? from the perspective of resilience, adaptation, and also decarbonization. Uh, this one is a tricky one. Uh, uh, what, what, what I can say from that is that we see that something that was a little bit lost uh, at the beginning of Smart City, it was the concept of, uh, of green city, of sustainable cities, which existed uh, 10 years before, and uh, which was really uh, uh, for building new policies and uh, the positioning of uh, private players in the urban fabric. And uh, after the, the smart city concept was launched, uh, there was a big mobilization around like, uh, what the, uh, we need to produce data and cities to, to use data as a resource to make it more efficient. And so the mobilization topics of uh, like creating a digitalized society at scale, uh, it faded away a little bit um, after that because uh, the policymaker said we need to have something stronger as a goal, uh, which is uh, like making uh, policy goals uh, achievable. And the policy goal we have is to make cities uh, able to face climate change because we want our cities to be green, to be attractive, to be and so on and so on. So data production, data usages, uh, the qu it was not an end, in, uh, an end in itself, and it became uh, something that needed to be uh, uh, like uh, joined with a bigger issue. And I think that uh, what we are experiencing now is the combination. The smart city is a mean to achieve a greater goal, which is sustainable cities. Uh, and we need we can produce these uh, sustainable cities with smart tools. It's basically how I see things in the coordination between these two concepts. Uh, the question that it raised, and I think that uh, and, uh, it's Gib that uh, gave the first uh, insight for that, it's uh, do we need uh, ultra high tech technologies, uh, ultra high tech solutions to make this goal achievable? Or can we maybe find some low tech solutions to make it? And it's, uh, I think it's a dilemma that uh, cities are dealing with today, and they are saying, okay, you, I, I agree to buy uh, all these digital, fancy digital platforms you are making, but is it really the best way to achieve this goal? And I think that we are in a period of test uh, saying, uh, is it the right path or not? 
and uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the presentation of Gib, uh, giving like these two visions of smart cities, uh, like high tech vision and low tech vision. And it uh, shows that the concept, the very concept of smart city, which is very uh, tech intensive uh, subject, may is uh, can be joined with uh, the question of uh, resiliency or climate change action. But maybe it's not the only it's not the only way. Uh, yeah, that's basically how I see things today. I, I'm not sure I answer your question. But, uh, I, I think you not only answered the question, but I think that you made a perfect transition to hear Marcelo, uh, because I think that you raised two important points from my perspective. One is that um, sustainable uh, smart cities is a mean to sustainable cities, and that usually we relate smart cities to super high tech technologies, but that's not necessarily the case. So I would like to hear Marcelo what he has to say about this. So not only answering the relation to smart cities, to climate change uh, from the perspective of resilience, adaptation and decarbonization, but also this topic, John, that you raised about, is it about super high tech technologies or can we think about a sustainable city with not necessarily the super high end, super costly technologies? So Marcelo. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I give the word to you now. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I think it's, it's very important, I mean, to have a balance in life and technology is super important and I use it a lot in the developments I do. And um, for example, like we were the first residential project in Costa Rica to have fiber optic to the home. So that allow us to have a super fast internet connection and allow us that we, all the people in the villages can work from home. They don't have to commute every day. And, and so that is, you know, like the amount of time you spend in traffic, uh, getting from one place to another or something, you can be more productive and have more time for other things that matter to each individual. So, you know, technology can help you a lot in life uh, if, it, if it helps in your favor. And I just saw a very funny commercial a few days ago of this guy that goes into the dentist and he gets, gets a dentist procedure and he comes back to the home and it was only this smart home with Alexa or one of those things that didn't recognize the voice because he had this he couldn't speak and he was st stuck outside. So it's how, how can you develop technology that plays in your favor and have this balance and you know all the all the homes and buildings common areas when when we develop are uh, tackled as well with uh, renewable energy that it tackles into a bigger, like we don't use uh, batteries, for example, because the Costa Rica grid is one of the most green grids in the world, like almost 100% of our energy comes from renew renewal sources. So it didn't make sense to have batteries, but during the day we have solar panels sending energy to the grid and taking energy at night. So in a, in a country like ours, uh, we are not, Act like uh, we are not tapping into the earth to take carbon, but we are producing uh, energy. It doesn't make sense to have a gasoline and diesel cars. So the part of this decarbonization uh, is how can we, and right now the government is giving a lot of incentives and charging stations all around the country to uh, decarbonize the economy as much as as possible and uh, re removing plastic from the equation and having electric cars it's uh, one of the solutions that we are giving a lot of importance right now so you know part um, part of uh, not only being resilient like how can you be regenerative in your design how you can produce more than you consume and and instead of waiting for climate change to get to a point of no return how can we do more right now 
on the way we live with the choices we make every single day. I think that's more important than just adaptation and waiting for the I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, definitely. And I think that you also bring another component that Jan mentioned and is the role of the public policies and in the government, in your case and in your example, providing the adequate incentives uh, for, for, for mitigating climate change and being resilient. So yeah, Marcelo, thank you so much. Yeah, not, not, only, not only waiting for the government to do, I mean, the government, it's, you know, we as citizens, we make that policy to the government. We pressure the okay. government to give those incentives and everything, not wait for them to do, like, we have the power to act and ask them to do things with, as citizens for, for us and for future generations. That's perfect. And we'll go deeper into that thought about citizen, citizen building and citizen participation in the next question. So I'm really glad you're bringing that point from now. And thanks for, for the clarification that those incentives were brought by the citizens to the government. Thank you so much, because I think that's key to, to, to the role of citizens and citizen engagement in this. Um, Hibran? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to touch on several of the points and, and to answer the question. I just want to go back to the, to the historical use of the term, the smart city, because in, in one of our discussions, we found out that it was actually Le Corbusier, the, the architect urban planner in the 20s and 30s who started with this concept. And, and his concept of smart city was actually what we know right now as a very dumb, inefficient city, which is like having all the production and, and uh, industrial activity on one side and residential somewhere else, and all, all these uh, separated functions of the city, which is part of the, um, the problem of, of uh, high traffic mega cities right now. And in that moment, that was the vision of, of what it was a smart city. And actually I have a, a graph here, if, if you look for the term, I think Marcelo maybe would like this. If you compare smart city and eco village in the in the history of the literature, we see that uh, uh, smart city is much older, the concept, and it was uh, even more popular re relatively to all the other terms in the literature. In, this is just uh, consider, considering English. And eco village exploded, the term eco village exploded in the 80s and it's much more popular than the smart city, even though we hear much more about smart cities in the in the like mainstream discourse, which I thought it was interesting. Uh, so one for me, one of the challenges of the smart cities for resilience and climate is precisely to break this uh, this vicious circle. If the cities keep uh, being focused on working and earning as a way to satisfy need, needs, but then the, then the sat, uh, satisfaction of needs uh, gets kind of forgotten and we all uh, start to focusing on rising living standards, which locks in uh, energy hungry lifestyle, you know, uh, or, or cities as well. Like any road you build, any building, if everything you we build will require some energy material flows to be sustained. And in, and in this kind of vicious circle, the needs get forgotten and, and we end up in this. So actually, whether technology or not, I think the focus is to, to go back to satisfying needs, which is the purpose of living in cities and the purpose of doing policy and doing everything we're doing. And uh, one, one of the examples of why uh, cities are so important, uh, coming back to the trends that we mentioned, um, I think one, one important point is that not like most of the people will live in cities in the future, but most of the half of the population will not live in mega cities. They will live in cities of less than half a million people, more than 60% of the population, which are quite manageable cities, cities of 300,000 uh, inhabitants. They can actually look like eco villages if we, if we have a vision for it. But I just want to have this example of Chinese and the carbon footprint the same level of income, middle income, 
in a rural context and in an urban context, here we can compare the, the uh, footprint, C uh, tons of, of CO2 per capita. And we see that it's almost half just by living in the city. And it, this is just by the kind of dynamics that the city promotes. And this is, uh, this is how important cities are for, for lifestyles and consumption, for example. Because normally we, we know that, that the more money people have, the more we, they will consume, but it actually matters how, where they live or how they live. So cities that give a rural feeling <laughs> or like uh, rural dynamics can actually do a lot to diminish this by producing your own food, not pro uh, providing your own mobility and, and all these kind of uh, things that we, we see here in the categories. And um, yeah, I think um, talking about data, uh, we, we use a lot of data to try to put uh, numbers into what we consume and what we produce at households. For example, we know that 20% from the, from the global emissions, households uh, take 65% of those emissions uh, if, you, if you consider the consumption of, of uh, products. Only 20% of the emissions are directly in the fuels we burn at house for cooking and, and heating and uh, cars but 80% are indirect emissions in the stuff we buy. So really smart cities or, or tech uh, has to do a lot with uh, trying to lower these embodied impacts. And, uh, and of course the, the uh, usefulness of more data is adding more resolution. For example, here we make this map at a regional level to know better the impacts at subnational level and know where to focus the efforts or some of our friends in, in, in Berkeley, they do these maps at the city level, at the zip code level, neighborhood level, to try to see where are the hotspots of carbon emissions and, uh, and so on. I'm gonna go back. So this is, this is like a good example of, of using data for, for climate solutions. And the, the question that we have seen with the data collectors, for example, Facebook, Google, and all these uh, large uh, companies is that the openness of the data is not there. So that's why, that's why I often remind the people that the data itself is not the issue. In, in terms of citizenship, uh, governments or laws or legislation has to be focused on opening data on making, of course, this hackathon and visualization days in Twitter, there's a huge community of people who are visualizing and trying to use the data. But as a rule of thumb, we process about six to maximum 10% of the data that we already generate, also in companies and in public, uh, uh, pu public data. So really we have to even today much more data than we can process. It's just that it's not easily accessible or not easily disclosable. And, and, and this is a, that kind of, uh, I think, uh, technology focus. And going back to Mar what Marcelo was saying about uh, technologies that, that are really needed. In, in my perspective, working with, uh, both in the smart, the smart grid uh, kind of thing, like John is working and also working with grassroots initiative, I, I found uh, like that technologies that add value to people, not only profit, not not like uh, not only like Uber or Airbnb that are about making profit, but also about adding value. For example, there's many apps about not wasting food, about repairing. Uh, for example, let me give you the example of the repair cafe movement. It's a movement to repair things between citizens. It started with one repair cafe in Amsterdam in 2008, and 10 years later, there's more than 1,000 of these cafes in the whole world. So, for example, a smart city, of course, includes uh, like this kind of, of spaces that have to do with technology, but the perp but they are run by citizens and managed by citizens, and the value and the data and the learning is kept with the citizens. You know, uh, and they also work for social learning to learn new practices, exchange new um, new ideas, new ways of doing things, and. Um, this, this is one uh, of the in inspiring trends that we don't hear so often. Uh, for example, there's also a very large trend in food cooperatives everywhere in the world, uh, in Europe and in, in the US and in Mexico even. Uh, many people, 
as what, as what Marcelo was saying, like not uh, relying on bringing food from somewhere else, but starting to produce food in an abandoned places or in spaces within the city, aquaculture, aquaponics, in, 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 uh, using the the sewer, the our human waste to bring back uh, as food instead of uh, to a sewage plant where we have to put a lot of chemicals and energy in order to uh, basically waste those resources that are uh, in our in our human waste. Uh, these kind of of solutions, and um, there's also an, a, a trend in uh, food cooperatives in repair cafes and in uh, and in eco villages. Actually, maybe you know about the global eco village network, but this this uh, this network has passed from dozens to hundreds in the last ten years as well. So there's actually a lot of people creating intentional communities, and I've worked also with a transition town network. Uh, many uh, city, smart cities that focus on sustainability have this uh, transition town, are, are, are members of the transition town movement, which is all about balancing civil society with technology for climate goals. And, and there's many more examples. There's the research by the IPCC group about strategies that are create synergies for mitigation and adaptation. Uh, and that, that have to do with institutions, tech, and society. I, I'm going to just finish with this slide so you can have it as a, as a reference. It's perhaps interesting for you. Um, let me just share it here. Yeah. This is the research by, this is published in Nature Climate Change, and it's an example of uh, urban mitigation strategies that uh, can create either a positive or a negative lock-in. For example, uh, high efficiency, low emission, smaller uh, vehicles, uh, they, they create a, a lock-in because you need uh, charging stations and stuff that you need to be, um, to be preserving. They create an institutional lock-in, like if we go all the way towards, uh, you know, uh, private, uh, privately owned vehicles, they might seem like a good idea, but then you are actually favoring policies in favor of private transport. Even though it's electric uh, vehicles is not uh, is not the ideal for, as you say, for very long term future because roads need maintenance forever, and the cars and batteries and, and all, all these uh, material cycles. And also, you promote this uh, behavioral lock in that uh, cars are seen as a status symbol. But you can reverse yeah. this Thank to you. promote. Thank you, Let's, if you want to wrap this idea so we can move on, please. No, that, that, that's it. I, I just wanted to share, I just wanted to share that, uh, that uh, kind of research about, uh, from Diana Urge Borsatz about uh, synergies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I, and I also think you, you, you've started bringing um, to the conversation the role of citizens with the Reaper cafes and the food mm -hmm. cooperatives. So let's, let's keep that thought. Uh, for the next mm -hmm. question. And you also bring an important point about data, who's collecting data and how open is that data and who's profiting from our data. So thank you for bringing those issues. Um, Karen, your thoughts about the relation of, city, of mass, smart cities uh, to approaching climate change from the perspective of resilience, adaptation and decarbonization. Karen, to you. Okay, thank you. So. About decarbonization, I think that it is quite obvious how technology sometimes can favor decarbonization in cities, like for example through smart grids or any other smart solutions. Uh, just to be quite like concise, um, and thinking about what Marcelo was saying about how we should invest all our efforts in mitigation rather than also uh, thinking about adaptation, well, I think that even if that is true, like we should actually be putting all our efforts in mitigation. Um, nowadays, uh, climate change has already had been consequ consequences in m the most vulnerable communities. We can see like what's happening right now in India with the big heat wave that arrived, like to that is affecting millions of people and they are just dying right now because of effects of climate change. And you can see that in a lot of different communities around the world of people that are suffering of droughts or flooding, and it can be attributed to climate change. So 
Um, in the case of these communities we, we've been working on, uh, we do agree that um, a bottom-up approach is necessary when creating solutions that try to uh, help them adapt to climate change and enhance their resilience. Um, we do think that we don't need to tell the communities that are already there like what they need to be doing because communities are currently having adaptation measures to climate change because they are already suffering of droughts or they are already suffering from heat waves or they are already suffering from uh, really extreme rainfall. They are, they are already placing strategic measures to survive those uh, climate events. So what we're what we can do to uh, help in the perspective of resilience or adaptation and climate change is maybe using our ideas to and maybe understand theirs to actually co-create a collaborative solution that will optimize their current strategies and make them more efficient or maybe we can show them like okay if you're doing this uh, if, if your need is this one maybe you can think of uh, using part of our knowledge to actually make your own idea more powerful so that it actually helps your whole community. And like, well, in terms of the carbonization and mitigation of climate change, well, it's obvious that if we use technology in the right way, then there can be a clear energy efficiency and a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, improving air quality. Um, there are a lot of uh, really like, key points in there in terms of mitigating climate change. So I think that smart city solutions include, uh, as Hibran was saying, like they, they can include like a lot of things and including mitigation and adaptation measures. So yeah, just to be like really compact in my answer because maybe we're running out of time. But yeah. Thank you, Karin. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to I'm going to give uh, the last question to you because I think uh, you 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 started briefly talking about this and about how citizens can be co-creators of the ideas how they already have powerful ideas maybe just need some support and orientation because as you say they are the ones already suffering with climate change. So the last question for all of you and Karen um starting with you is what can smart cities bring to citizens and citizen building and i would add to add i would add to that citizen participation and citizen engagement okay well we do know that sometimes most of the climate actions currently are taking place from a top-down perspective and uh, we do have a lot of grassroots initiatives, but what we have seen from the climate change arena is that we have like these international agreements and they try always like to have a really top-down approach. Um, and we do think that if, that there has been a big gap in the, in the communication between all the stakeholders, including the communities and other institutions, other NGOs, other civil society organizations. And they do need to actually start communicating because maybe we have like already a lot of solutions coming from science, but if, but scientists are like some of the solutions just stay in papers or some policies are not really taking into consideration what communities actually suffering, like the reality of the community. So I think that um, by, creating these solutions in the smart in terms of smart cities it would enhance like the power of the community that they could have and what reality they actually want to build and what they are actually um, needing in the present terms in terms of climate change so i think that well what this means is that governance in general can be um Put in better terms than the ones that we actually have in the present. In the present, so um, well, we've seen some cases, uh, as I was discussing before with them, uh, about how in Puebla they 
already have been trying to create smart city solutions. And for example, in Santa Maria Ton and Sintla, they started to create this initiative that was called Barrio Smart, but it ended up affecting the community in negative ways rather than helping them. So they had to actually like go to court and be like, hey, we don't want a smart city solution here. And so if communities are not really uh, taken into consideration when creating these solutions, as these solutions are not really going to be used or not going to be really accepted. So um, I think that by doing it properly, then it could actually enhance governance and uh, be more, a more democratic process. So yeah, that would be like in a really broad term what my answer would be. Thank you, Karen, thank you so much. Um, we only have nine minutes left. So I'm gonna ask uh, the uh, Hebron, Marcelo and Jan to be uh, very brief so we can just make a one minute wrap up. Uh, so Hebron, your, your, the point about citizen participation, citizen engagement and how mm -hmm. can smart cities promote citizen engagement? Yes, uh, well, so just to, um, to illustrate, so there's many contexts, uh, the individual context, the social context, and the technical context. And what smart cities can do is facilitate the interaction between these contexts. So uh, at the individual level, try to promote the intrinsic motivation, the empowerment of, of groups, and, and support those groups that are trying to do this uh, open data and sustainability focus and all these things. Uh, the social context create uh, platforms for shared economy, gift economy, uh, networking, and all this. At uh, the technical context, enable pros prosumers instead of just consumers. Plan against plan. Uh, uh, try to fight planned obsolescence and uh, you know, innovate technology, uh, technological use that is available, like adequate technologies. And uh, in general, all of the contribution or opportunity for smart cities is to promote this social learning process, which is this organic collective cogni cognitive process where we create new norms, new skills and practices. Uh, and as uh, Karen uh, said, is not, is um, more resilient than to just plan and then the government it's uh, out of turn and then the plan is dropped. So that will be my wrapping up. <laughs> Thank you, Hibran, Marcelo, and your perspective. And in your perspective, it will be interesting. It will be interesting to know, in the case of Costa Rica, how could how were citizens able to influence public policies are, around climate change? Yeah. <laughs> It's, you know, I, I think it has to do a lot. Uh, there is a famous um, say from Albert Einstein that says, we cannot solve problems by using the same kind of thinking we use when we create them. So I have to, I've, I'm convinced that it has to do with education and how uh, we are being educated the same way for decades and decades and decades. And the, the world is changing so much, so rapidly, the knowledge and everything, and, and it's impossible to absorb all that knowledge. So I think it's in crucial right now to teach our kids learn how to learn. Three thinkers, people that can think outside the box, that can innovate and do things in a different way. I'm very involved with a school that I'm a co-founder that is called Casa Sula. And that's something that I'm so passionate about because I think in order to create a true change in citizens, in citizen empowerment and future generations is starting with the little ones. And part of uh, this change is coming up with solutions that can, that can impact as a whole society. What can we do to make it better? And that, that's pretty much what, what I see happening in Costa Rica constantly from, like if you think about the energy matrix, Costa Rica in the 70s when the barrel of petrol was $3 per barrel, wanted to go to renewals and all the banks, all the institutions or things like that, they were against it saying, you know, it doesn't make financial sense because gasoline is, petrol is so cheap. Why would you invest in this right now it doesn't make any sense financially 
And they say, I know financially it doesn't make sense, but that will not be able to sustain itself in the future. And having that kind of thinking and innovation and everything in different areas, avoiding like not having an army for 70 years and spending that money in health and education is what makes it possible to uh, for a country to be in a cutting edge. And I think it's possible because it's a smaller country and it's not so big that it gets out of proportion and it cannot be controlled as more most of like Colombia, Mexico, United States. It's so big. So like it's uh, very hard to create policies for the people. The people are not heard and a few people make decisions based on their own interests. So I think it's it's important that people can see the problems and find solutions and be involved in the solutions. Uh, I think Catalina, I don't know if I think Catalina went offline, but uh, I cannot hear you. But uh, yeah. I think Catalina went offline. But I just, guess John, it's your turn that we are running out of time. Yes, <laughs> but we're uh, if you guys want to take a bit more of time to end up uh, and your ideas and conclusions, we can go a bit more over the hour. I John, think you want to speak right now? Go ahead, John. Um, and just just to make sure about the question about the citizen uh, involvement in the city fabric uh, for climate change action and resiliency, um, of course, I think the question we ask there is uh, to know who produces the city uh, and uh, uh, how do we align uh, three kind of players that are uh, involved. Yes. Okay, I, I, I hear some strange noises, so do I continue? What do I do? <laughs> go ahead, John, go ahead. Um, so uh, my point is that uh, we have so like uh, three kind of players and the question is always the same, is how do we put citizens in the city fabric? Meaning that we have on one side the policy makers, and on the other side, the private players uh, who are providing all the technical means, most of them uh, in many cases, to produce the city. And uh, the question uh, for citizens and bottom-up approaches is to say, uh, how do we connect uh, private players with citizens? And uh, how do how is the public player able to manage this relationship between the citizens and private players? Uh, in fact, what I'm stating is that uh, there are so two kind of big uh, so two types it's not impossible to say that but if we make like generalization we see that on one hand we have like companies that are providing uh, services like network services uh, for basic needs uh, energy uh, like they are for uh, in, uh, access to waste water housing, and so on and so on. So companies and public players are providing these basic needs that define the urban life. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you have like new companies, and startups and things like that, that are providing new services or trying to imply the uh, citizens in new ways of producing the city. So in my view, we have two worlds that are, uh, uh, in, that are like, like uh, Two ways of producing the city that are facing each other uh, the way of bottom up startup uh, things uh, producing a new way uh, of producing the city based on citizen approaches like a horizontal uh, view of uh, everybody is able to participate everybody has a vision and so on and the tra traditional way of producing the cities with um, <clears throat> public players uh, uh, acting with big uh, utilities and producing like a, a network city that is the basis of uh, fundamental needs. So the question is, how do we connect these two worlds? Um, so I think that uh, today this, uh, this, this bridge between the two, two worlds is being developed from both sides, private and public, and people are saying, okay, how do we imply citizens in the production of, for example, how do we 
imply them in the energy generation and energy supply of a city. But the question is really tricky because uh, do people may have like an opinion or I want green energy in my city and so on. But the question is how do we produce it with the citizens? It becomes a little bit more tricky. Same for waste, same for water, same for uh, same for transportation and so on. So the question is where we uh, imply citizens in this fabric. And uh, I think that's the main uh, topic. And if we want to tackle these questions of climate change and resiliency, it will be uh, on these basic infrastructure needs that we will be able to introduce citizen opinions and ways to act, and that we will be able to have like a bottom-up city or something like that. But how do we make it? What is the mean? That is, I think, still the question. So it's not an answer. It's an open question that I ask in response to the question. But it's my, my thinking that I share with you here. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so we're running out of time, but I wanted to know if any of you had any last thoughts or comments, like super quick. I know we could stay forever talking about these things because I think we're just sort of uh, talking about the tip of the iceberg, but any last comments, any last thoughts, uh, please, um, if anybody wants to say something, please go ahead. Uh, I wanted okay. to thank uh, I wanted to thank you for doing a great job leading this panel and like being a great host and to low carbon cities for inviting us. It's very uh, very informative and great to hear different perspectives and seeing how many people we are working on so many different aspects around the world. And it's very, very inspiring to see more and more of this happening. And thank, thank you, Marcelo. You. I also learned a lot from all of you. So thank you for your comments. Um, if anybody wants to say something, let me also say a few words from what I learned today. Um, sounds obvious, but it's easier to manage smaller citizens and smaller countries rather than large cities. Living in Medellin for the last 15 years, the city has become so big that it's really difficult to manage. Maybe Adriana can also relate to that. Um, also, the other question for me, and it's also related to our work at Makaya every day, is that citizens finally are at the center of, of everything. We need to continue giving them and giving us as citizens as well the voice that we deserve. Uh, we've also talked about the role of three of the three sector three sectors, public, private, and civil society. How smart cities are not an end but as a mean to sustainable cities and to human development, and the whole thing about co-creation and combining top-down and bottom-up approaches sounds obvious as well, but has been mentioned throughout the conversation. So. Thank you, all of you. If I, Karen, I don't know if you wanted to say something. I see that the camera is pointing at, at you. Thank you also so much. I learned a lot, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Yeah, I was just Karen? wanting to thank all of you. It was really interesting to get to know what you're doing, and we're open for future collaborations. If, if, if there is something that we could create together, it would be really nice to have a future conversation. So thank you all.